now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. Zooming along here on a busy Wednesday morning in your nation's capital at 706. Thanks for tuning in to O'Connor and Company. If you missed any of our program up until now, why don't you subscribe to our podcast so you can catch it later. Coming up at 735, Congressman Mike Waltz of Florida about that hearing yesterday over Afghanistan. And then at 815, Lauren Boland, spokesperson for the National Cherry Blossom Festival, because the blossoms are in bloom. And we're right in the today's the first day of the festival. Right? Yeah. Julie Gunlock, Larry O'Connor, you are almost at the point where you got to start thinking about colleges, right? Yes. Your oldest is a junior right now? Mm, Sophomore. Sophomore. Mm -hmm. Sophomore. So next year's kind of go time. Yeah. And for those parents who have seniors, right now is sort of you're getting the acceptance letters back or the rejection letters back. (laughs) And you have to make some decisions. And a lot of parents, like me, I went through this last year with my uh, number three child, uh, you're finding out that college admissions are a lot different than not just when you were this age, but a lot different than like five years ago, the changes have been so rapid. So I wanted to address that. We've got Lori Kopp Weingarten. She's a certified educational planner at One Stop College Counseling. Ma'am, thanks for joining us today. So nice to be here. Well, I'll give you my experience. When my son was applying to colleges, he had great SATs. He had great transcripts. He had, like, you know, all the AP classes and all that stuff. And he was kind of stunned to realize that despite what his counselors were telling him coming into high school, a lot of colleges are now sort of not really taking that stuff into effect or certainly not weighing it as much as they used to. Is that the case? Yes. So testing has become marginalized in college admissions, especially since COVID, but even pre-COVID, there were a lot of colleges that were starting to say, oh, what is testing really measuring? Because it's it's directly correlated. Test scores are directly correlated with parental education, parental income, and, and also with race. So then colleges were saying, well, what are we really measuring here? So test scores started to become much less important in the process than COVID hit. People couldn't test. The student, nobody wanted to, nobody wanted to proctor teenagers Mm. in a room Mm. during COVID. So they had to go test optional. So almost every college went test optional. There were a few holdouts, but now things are changing. And some of the colleges are now saying, wait a minute, we thought tests weren't important, but maybe they actually are important. So some of them are coming back. So I'm glad that Julie doesn't have a junior because some of the juniors are freaking out right now because it is all of a sudden they're being told, wait, some colleges are now requiring it. It's late to tell a junior hmm. to start taking the SAT or ACT. So, yeah, it's it's so it's like a whirlwind of change. So during those COVID years where the SAT and other standardized tests weren't required, what what was the criteria? Was it just grades? Was it activities? You mentioned race. You, what Did they throw all of the sort of measurements out and just guess? I, I don't <laughs> understand how these colleges <laughs> determined what made a good, what would make a good student. Yeah, it's a great question. So, well, they were really trying to focus heavily on the transcript instead of using as the academic profile the transcript and testing. So now here they are saying, okay, let's really dig, take a deep dive into the high school transcript and look at the grades and the rigor of the students. What's unfortunately happened is this has become the generation of everybody gets an A. Hmm. So now yeah. they're looking at transcripts and everybody has A. I think the numbers, like 68% of kids are graduating high school with an A average. Mm-hmm. For eight years ago, it was like 20%, you know, yeah, decades yeah, yeah. ago. So the, the grades are going up. So now they're saying, well, what do we do? Everyone has an A and now there are no test scores. Hmm. So yes, of course, once they do an academic review, they're moving on to essays and interviews if they offered it and activities mm. and everything else that, and the teacher recs and the counselor recs. But the problem is that academic review, some of the I speak to admission officers all the time. Some of them have said to me kind of on the side, like, you know, it would, it would be nice to have a test score or test scores aren't all bad or sometimes mm, we just need wow. that test score. <laughs> yeah. Wow. 
Lori Cobb Weingarten is our guest. She's a certified educational planner. One Stop College Counseling is the website. It's one-stopcc.com. And I see from your CV here that you've got Wharton School of Business, University of Pennsylvania. Thank you very much on your uh, resume, which is very cool. But, you know, um, Penn and Harvard and Columbia, they were in the news for all the wrong reasons at the end of last year in December that that hearing that ended up seeing the departure of the president of uh, Penn and uh and Harvard, Columbia is still sort of hanging yeah. by a thread there, if I remember. Or no, it was MIT. Excuse yeah, me, it, it was wasn't. MIT, it wasn't yeah. Columbia. Have you seen yeah. a, a, because of that, and because of some of the other activities and things that we've seen at the more prestigious Ivy League schools? Have you seen sort of a shift from parents and students in prioritizing schools like that? So I have seen it, not as much as what's being reported sometimes in the news. A lot of students, to be honest, this is kind of a sad statement, but a lot of families, students and families have said to me, you know what, the, they were in the news for the, the way they handled anti-Semitic anti, anti remarks and mm -hmm. anti-Semitism. A lot of the students are saying it's kind of everywhere right now, so it's not going to make too much of a difference of oh where gosh, I go. Oh, that which is, is sad. Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing that a lot. Oh. Um, because it's not just those schools where at UC Berkeley, there's an investigation going on. There have mm -hmm. been, I mean, I, I could go on and on. It's basically almost every selective school. I work primarily with students trying for these highly selective colleges, and it's pervasive, unfortunately. I have a, a quick question about, we hear a lot about the mental health crisis among young people mm -hmm. in this country. Um, what are you finding when you talk to students? How are they doing sort of mentally and socially after years of closed schools and social isolation? isolation? Are you finding that, that, that kids are recovering, are they getting better, or is are we sort of going down this sort of despair spiral even more? So it, it's, it's complicated. I think that before COVID hit, I was already seeing quite a few mental health issues with these, especially these high achieving students who mm. are trying so hard. They have very, you know, they're focused on these lofty goals of getting into an Ivy League or a school similar caliber. And then COVID hit and that social isolation was a disaster for, for everybody. It wasn't just the teens, but it, I, I work with teens. So that's who I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. it, it got pretty bad. And this year, the, the seniors this year were the ones who many of them had ninth grade remote. So they, they had mm. the end of, they never really finished eighth grade and ninth grade was remote. I had a situation where we do a lot of mock interviews. So we prep them for college interviews for the first time ever. We had to tell quite a few students, please don't interview. You're, we're not going to be able to get your interviewing skills up um, mm -hmm. quickly enough. Mm. But I'm seeing, so now we're doing things with our younger kids to make sure that they have the social skills, and I'm seeing a, an improvement. So, like, our sophomores coming in, they're, they're doing better. Good. Well, on behalf of all radio hosts everywhere, I wish you could transfer that education on interview skills to some of our <laughs> guests that we have. You accepted, though. You're a fabulous guest, and we appreciate you joining I, I, us. Larry, I'm so oh, sorry. I just have one yeah, last question. Ahead, sorry, uh, and second. this is a personal sure. question for you. Uh, you ahead. know, there's another person in the education field um, uh, with the name Weingarten. Do you sometimes get mistaken for her? And uh, are you getting any hate mail? <laughs> <laughs> um, I I never I have never been mistaken for her. I do get asked if I'm related, and I will answer. I am. I have no relation to her. Oh good. Um, I don't be sorry about that. About <laughs> but, <laughs> well, I will but say no, I will no say when now. I saw this in the show run, I thought, oh my God, is Randy coming on the show? <laughs> Which we would welcome. We'd yes, love to exactly. speak with the uh, fine teacher, the uh, <laughs> president of the teachers union. All right, Laurie Copwhitegarden, thank you so much. Great stuff. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's so one-stop nice. con college counseling. One-stop college counseling. By the way, this is the first in a series of uh, various segments we're going to do on this issue. Uh, we're also going to talk about those uh, students who are not choosing your typical liberal arts college or, mm. or STEM-type education and going for a trade school yeah. and learning a craft. And we're also going to talk about uh, the children who are graduating high school and choosing to enlist in the military. Mm and serving our nation. All of those choices should be honored, respected, and celebrated, and that's exactly what we'll do here. WMAL's Free Speech Forum is back, Sunday, June 2nd at the Birchmere. Details online now at WMAL.com slash Free Speech Forum. We've got more news from the royal family.
focused yeah. on the Kate Middleton. I'm going to try my best not to talk about the alleged affair and the <laughs> woman who sort Your of looks best. like Kate Middleton, but really, it's like it's like. Here's what she looks like. I love like. how you explain. No, no, no. This You're like, I'm, I'm going to do talk- my best. This is, this is what I'm not going to talk about. This is what about. I'm not going to yes. talk about. I'm not going to talk about the woman who was allegedly the girlfriend of William that has sort of started this whole thing, which not of true. course is not happening at not all. Not happening. But I realize what she looks like. She looks I love like, how you're not you're you're explaining what you're not going to talk that's about. That's right. I will I will not us. be discussing this. That would be wrong. It's gossip and I don't do that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, sure. That's a sin. Um if a really low budget film company <laughs> so mean. was going to do their own version of The Crown and they needed to hire some actress who, you know, maybe has done some good dinner theater here and there. Mm-hmm. Uh, We want you to play Kate Middleton. She's all we can afford. That's what she looks like. She looks like sort of like the, we used to call it, you know, in in Broadway, you have your Broadway show and then your first national tour and then your second national tour and they do all the big cities. And eventually you've got your bus and truck. The bus and truck does like three cities a week. Yeah, so they cast Mrs. Ed. (laughs) Right. There you go. They cast. You say if you're on the busted truck, you're there's probably so like. Many, there are so many millennials and Gen Zers right now who are like Mrs. Ed. Mrs. Ed. Who's Mrs. Ed? No, they watched it on Nick Mr. at Night. Mr. Ed. They watched it on the Nick show. Nick. I'm referencing. It's a good thing William wasn't named Wilbur. Right? Yes. I love you, True. Wilbur. All right. So anyway, we're not going to talk about that. Right, though, right. Because that talk would about just this. be cheap and tawdry and rude. No. Yes. Talk about cheap and tawdry and rude. Well, it turns out that England has a national health service. Yes. It's nationalized medicine, and yes. so the government controls all the hospitals and all the medical yes. choices, yes. right? And the royal family, well, Kate Middleton, she utilized one of the hospitals because well, yeah, you have no choice. But she, uh, she. You know, she goes to the bougie one sure. right there in London. And then somebody inside. And someone, someone got, tried to get her records. Her medical records. Uh, can you imagine how valuable those are with oh, all the course. mystery? Are you kidding? I mean, I might do that. The Daily Mail is out there like I with know. a blank check. There's a million take, bucks. Right. We will Probably more. We will dump yes. the gold bullion in your driveway. This has gotten to the driveway. point of like, you know, pictures of Diana vacationing with the, you know, <laughs> hairy dude. Oh, you know, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. With the photographs. Yeah. The, the hairy dude. <laughs> Whatever his name was. <laughs> he di- the man Sorry. died. Sorry. In the Sorry. car crash. Sorry. Sorry. Anyway. Right. He but, was, um, he's an Egyptian. Yeah, it's, well, it's anyway. Like, he's very he hairy. Like an anyway, so, uh, so it's gotten to that So now there's a full-blown point. government investigation yes. into a breach of Kate Middleton's medical records at the London Clinic. To find out that, that her uh, abdominal secretary, sec- sec- oh my God, surgery. <laughs> yes. Slash plastic surgery. Yeah. The details. Of you it, believe yeah. it was a nose job or something? No, I or maybe don't. Like she has a, t- a perfect a nose. Tummy tuck, I'm only kidding. A butt lift. No, I don't know. I think she had. I, it, my theory is that she has something like Crohn's oh. or diverticulitis or mm. something that required some sort of abdominal abdominal surgery, abdominal surgery right. and that they don't want to talk about it because they don't have to talk about it because she's you know wants to be private uh, when it okay. comes to her colon. I get it. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. But see, there's a trade-off when you when you're the royal family well, and you're you get, living uh, off of the. Then you get all the, you know, she got plastic surgery, right? right. Worse, exactly. Yeah. Um, what was the thing we weren't going to talk about? I can't remember the horse. Oh, the horse girl. Yeah, the girl. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> so terrible. The girl who looks like the the equine she's version not that, of that Kate she Middleton is Rose Hanbury, and she's very right. she's very attractive. Well, we have an update on horse girl. Uh, Rose Hanbury is very upset by the of course she is rumors that she had an affair with Prince William. Uh, she's royally miffed, they say. Rose Hanbury, 40. The marchioness of Shrubala. She has been, according to the New York Post, is in the spotlight for research and rumors that she had an affair with William, or as she calls him, Wilbur. <laughs> Uh, both parties denied it. She says, I know people who know the marchioness of Shrubala. Very, very well. I want a title like that. So do I. Come on. Well, you have wine, the Duke ambassador. And Duchess of... Stop complaining. Um, she's absolutely was not having an affair with the Prince of Wales. Was not having an affair. See? See how the wording? Oh, she wasn't good. having good. an affair. But now she is. That's according to a royal expert named Nick Bullen talking to Us Weekly. He said even when those rumors broke a few years ago, she was very upset by them. She's still very upset by them now. There. So stop. Everybody just stop it. By the way, Donald Trump defended oh, Kate. You got Middle- a lot of nerves. Everyone, stop it. Everyone, nay, stop it. I mean, <laughs> okay. I it's good fodder for our show. <laughs> Um, Trump has come to Kate Middleton's defense over the whole doctored I'm sure photo she's thing. Thrilled. <laughs> Trump staunchly defends Kate Middleton in the photo scandal, saying it shouldn't be a big deal. 
Everybody doctors photos. <laughs> you know, these movie actors, you see them in real life, you say, is that the same person in that picture? It's true. Have you seen Uma Thurman it is lately? True. <laughs> she like goes to the plastic Look, surgeon. There's a reason I do radio. Okay. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Uma Thurman goes to the plastic surgeon. The doctor says, what's it going to be today? She goes, I don't, Photoshop me. I don't care. Just Photoshop me. I want the Kate Middleton Photoshop experience. So there you go. The good news is. Oh, and also one, one other update. You know how our friend now Gardner over at Heritage's has been trying to beat the drum that yes. Prince Harry should be deported. Yes. Because he lied on his immigration yeah. forms because he's Cause admitted he's a to drug. Right, he's a drug user. He said it in his book, mm-hmm. but he denied it in his mm-hmm. immigration forms. So Donald Trump was asked. He said, would you consider deporting 100%. Prince Harry? And he said, eh, we'll have to see. <laughs> like every reason in the world to vote What's for this guy. What's in it for me? On, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Let's see. It is 724. Making sense of your world. Greatly appreciated. News Talk 105.9 WMAL. I love listening to you. Making sense of the news. Now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. 737 here on O'Connor and Company. Thanks for tuning in on a super busy Wednesday morning. Coming up at 815, we're going to speak with Lauren Bolin. She's the spokesperson for the National Cherry Blossom Festival. And I've had to promise Julie Gunlock and everyone else in my life that I will not ask her any stupid questions about why those trees don't produce cherries. Apparently, Ornamental. Yes. I, I'm, apparently, people thought that it was a stupid question. <laughs> it's not Don Lemon did a black hole swallow up the Malaysian airliner stupid. You know when but your teacher says there's no stupid questions? They're lying. There are definitely stupid <laughs> questions. And I asked one of them. I'm sorry. When you call it a cherry tree, there should be a cherry. That's all I'm saying. All right. We'll move on. Yeah. <clears throat> Joining us right now, Representative Mike Waltz, who, by the way... It's way too smart for this kind of he silly ask morning questions. show conversation. No, he does not. And he had a lot of very important yes. and serious questions for the generals who oversaw the Afghan withdrawal, resulting in chaos, the abandonment of Americans and our Afghan allies, and, of course, the death of 13 service members. He's a U.S. Army Green Beret, and his book is called Warrior Diplomat. Congressman Waltz, always great to talk to you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ray. Uh, there were several moments here that uh, really raised my eyebrows. Uh, I'd love for you first to address uh, General Milley confirming that our allies, who we left behind, were not only tracked down and murdered, but in some cases in, as he put it, pretty brutal ways. Not only is that horrific and immoral and unjust in terms of those men and women who braved the life to help us against the Taliban for the last 20 years, but how does this affect our ability to conduct future endeavors where we need to go into a country and say, hey, work with us. We got your back. Well, it's devastating, uh, whether it's uh, the Kurds or you know some tribes in Africa uh, where terrorism is fomenting, we have to be able to go in and work with locals and the locals that side with us, that stand with the United States against extremism or against our enemies, are not. they're not only putting their lives on the line, they're putting their whole family's lives on the line. And the entire world got the message that uh, America will abandon you. And those allies are still being hunted down as we speak in Afghanistan by the Taliban. And there are still veterans groups in the United States that – on their own dime, uh, many of them have bankrupted themselves trying to get these people alive or trying to keep these people alive. It's just um, it's it's just wrong and heartbreaking. On on Twitter, you said to the Gold Star families who lost their loved ones at Abbey Gate, our government has failed you. You then went on to say this. You said there's a difference between responsibility and accountability, and there's been no accountability taken by the Biden administration. That goes into the fact that very few, I think only two Democrats showed up for this uh, hearing. Why are, are the Democrats so lacking in curiosity and, and wanting accountability on this issue? Well, because, <laughs> you know, it sits at the feet of Joe Biden. Uh, and uh, they were, I guess, uh, not too eager to sit and explain uh, uh, in front of the world, you know, um, or or hear questions or commentary on how his failure of leadership, his absence of leadership and the incompetence at the State Department and at the White House 
uh, led to this debacle and all of the disastrous re- results since. And, you know, look, I'll I'll give both uh, General Milley and McKenzie, who is the commander for all Middle East, uh, some credit. They didn't pull punches yesterday. I wish they had done it while in uniform. There's mm-hmm. a lot of people who think they should have resigned. But they made it very clear uh, their recommendations uh, were ignored, their recommendations to keep that major air base, which, oh, by the way, is not just for counterterrorism. It's only a couple hundred miles from China. Um, oh. and, uh, and to keep our a small group of special forces, which would have kept the Afghans fighting and would have kept the government and would have kept al Qaeda and ISIS from reemerging, which they are uh, oh. right now. So Biden ignored four four-star generals mm. uh, who took that advice. And then once he gave the order to fully withdraw, the general said, OK, well, we need to bring um, American citizens, the embassy, uh, our allies that are at risk. We need to bring everyone. And State Department said no, refused. So, And then yeah. that led to the debacle when they reversed course and said, no, no, now get everybody out at the mm. very last second once chaos yeah. had emerged. Uh, and, and led to the disaster that had those Gold Star families there and, yesterday. And General McKenzie said in the hearing um, specifically that they had a complete p- plan to execute the task of getting citizens at risk of Afghanistan's and the withdrawal of the embassy done. They were specifically ordered not to do that. Now, of course, President Biden has said that he took the advice of all the generals and no one said that there was a problem here. No one had an alternative plan. So someone's lying here. Was anyone from the administration subpoenaed to this hearing? Did you get anyone under oath to explain this discrepancy? Well, we have uh, Anthony Blinken coming at the end of the month, and uh, I assure you, I'm going to have those questions for. Uh, I'm going to have those questions for him. That's great. Uh, because at the end of the day, that was his decision, obviously with the approval uh, of the approval of the president. And a back to, you know, everyone sits around and says, well, maybe this wasn't as good, except for President Biden, who says it was an outstanding success. God. But not not only has not a person been fired, uh, there are journalists now working on uh, on pieces on all the people that are being promoted that were <laughs> responsible for it. And that's just a slap in the face uh, to those families. Congressman Waltz, uh, Waltz um, you are, are an Army Green Beret. You still serve. Uh, by the way, uh, I think everybody should know that. And so I, given that, I would love for you to speak to this issue, not just from how it affects our foreign policy and our future national security interests in deploying troops overseas mm-hmm. and the relationship with the countries, which obviously has been damaged by this. But our, the Marines are the only service branch who have met their recruitment numbers here. There's a lot of theories as to why that's happening. But the way this has been treated, when when a, when a man or woman decides to wear the uniform and make that agreement, that oath to give their life if necessary, when parents support and encourage their children to do that or spouses mm-hmm. do that, um, when you see how how the generals in charge of those young men and women's lives and and how the civilian oversight from the White House behave themselves here, can you draw a con- direct line here? in terms of the lack of recruitment, the lack of interest in joining a military that is going to behave this way. And how do we fix that, sir? Yeah, I I do think there's a direct correlation, and we're seeing it in uh, the data and polling that a number of groups uh, are making of of young people. Uh, Look, they want to... um, They want to jump out of planes, kick in doors, be out on a ship, and defend a great nation and do bad things to people who may mean us harm. Uh, and when you see uh, the, the nation's most high profile, longest war, uh, that if you think about the current generation, they were all born around 9-11, mm-hmm. uh, end this way where we not only abandon our allies that stood and fought with us, we abandoned fellow Americans. Uh, we surrendered, we cut and run, and jihad won, uh, and, uh, and America lost. Uh, that was really the message that this sent. And not only did that kick off our adversaries all over the world, whether it was Ukraine or South China Sea, now we have gangs in Haiti that all believe this is opportunity. But, um, you know, it, it's people want to be led and they want to be inspired yeah. uh, and they want to believe that they are working together for uh, a, a common mission that's going to be successful. And we're seeing in the data now, this is the kicker that um, current active duty members are dr- dramatically reducing in uh, those that would recommend that their children 
join. And the vast majority of new recruits are from military families. And so that's a double loss. It's military members getting out. It's a retention problem. And then you're losing the next generation of military families. And Congressman, I just want to emphasize this one point, because I know for a fact, young officers are trained right now. Mistakes happen. Things happen. Nobody is perfect. Bad decisions were made here. The problem is accountability. They are they are trained as young right. officers that yeah. sure mistakes are going to happen, but we need to make sure that everybody's held accountable so that we learn from those mistakes. This is why we have you know military instruction in schools, academies that are dedicated to this sort of thing. No accountability, Congressman Waltz. That's what really burns people. Not a single person has been even laterally <laughs> moved, uh, much less uh, demoted, fired, or relieved. Not one across the entire government for everybody that was involved and several over at state and the White House are being promoted to ambassadorships and and other positions. I'm glad you and your colleagues are continuing on this. We're looking forward to the next hearing as slim as that majority is in the House. uh, And it is a slim majority for the Republicans. It's enough. One one seat majority is enough. Majority. That's right. If we didn't have this majority. We wouldn't even have had these hearings. That's we, right. would, we wouldn't have any of them. Democrats uh, didn't want to ask these questions. Got Hunter Biden's, right. Today we've got Hunter Biden's business partners. So yeah. on, to the, on to the next one. On to the <laughs> next war. All right, Congressman Waltz, thanks for joining right. us as always, sir. Thank you. 747. All right, you remember yesterday we told you this story. Luke Rosiak reporting at The Daily Wire. There was a teacher at a Montgomery County high school who complained about a uh, pro-Hamas protest where students were praising Hitler and calling for the death of Jews. Yes. This teacher complained to the principal. The pr- principal wrote the teacher up on charges. Yeah. Right. It's in her dis- permanent file. For disciplinary action. Well, we've got a follow-up to this story, and mm. I'm sure that you're thinking that the follow-up is the teacher has been redeemed and her reputation has been restored and the principal has been disciplined, if not fired. No, no, no. That's not how Montgomery County Public Schools rolls. No, no, no. The principal's been promoted the day after the story was reported. Did this principal also manage the Afghan withdrawal? (laughs) Pretty much. Pretty much. Pamela Crosswell has now been promoted as uh, principal of Wheaton High School. Mm. Brand new appointment. Bigger high-profile gig. (sighs) That's Montgomery County Public Schools. Can I give an unsolicited plug to our friend Bethany Mandel? who is running for the Montgomery County Board of Education. Uh, she'd like to be one voice, just one, one voice in that body that says, That hey, might ask some questions. Maybe this isn't the way we should roll, guys. Maybe this anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic behavior isn't kind of good. And maybe folks. the teachers who blow the whistle on this kind of behavior yeah, should be praised should be praised and protected and At, not or promoted. disciplined. Yeah. Uh, Bethany Mandel, Montgomery County Board of Education. Check it out.